Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on your brunch time, your early morning here on Sunday. I am Jen from Wine Antics, and this is a new show. This is uh, an opportunity for us to show you a little bit about what happens beyond the bottle. And today we're actually featuring some great producers from uh, Loudoun County, Virginia. We have Mark Os Osborne from uh, Adroit Theory Brewing Company. We have Doug Fabioli from Fabioli Cellars. We have Peter Alf and Mark Cre uh, Creighton from uh, Mount Defiant Cidery and uh, Distillery. And of course we have uh, Kelsey Cornell from Visit Loudon and we're featured here so uh, graciously by her on the Visit Loudon page. I have a very special co-host that I've co-hosted for many months now, these live shows, who is Stubb from Cork Envy and I'd love for him to introduce himself. Hi, Stubb from CorkEnvy.com. Uh, thanks for joining us today on Beyond the Bottle. Uh, we're excited to uh, to be here, and we're going to start off the show by talking with uh, Corsi, Kelsey Cornell from uh, Visit Loudoun, where Loudoun County has more than 40 uh, wineries and is known as D.C.'s wine country, but it also features uh, a growing uh, craft beer scene as well as a distilling scene there. So let's bring Kelsey on to uh, talk a little bit about Loudoun County. Uh, welcome to the show, Kelsey, and thanks for joining us this morning. Good morning. Uh, can we start by asking you, like, uh, what does Visit Loudoun mean to the audience? Um, maybe just tell us a little bit about uh, Loudoun County, uh, if we were to be visitors to the wonderful place that is Loudoun. Yeah, so Visit Loudoun is the tourism organization for Loudoun County. So our entire goal of the organization is to just show off how awesome Loudoun is. And that definitely encompasses our beverage industry. Like you said, there are 40 wineries, 20 breweries, cideries, distilleries, everything. And we're really proud of that product. So you'll definitely have a lot of amazing drinks to have if you come to visit. Um, but beyond that, we're a huge resource for travel information. So we provide tourists and guests guidance and recommendations on dining or where to stay, what to do, whether it's visiting a historic site or going water rafting, riding horses, um, as well as um, great events and everything like that there is to do in London. Wow, that sounds really amazing, and and we're so fortunate to to have you and have and host us on your page because it is so great. There's tons of people that love Loudon, and and Stubb and I are both local to Virginia, so we know and we visited the area, not just for the show. Um, as uh, so this month, October was a big mm -hmm. month for yes. uh, Loudoun and wine in Virginia overall. Uh, it, was, it was Virginia Wine Month. What kind of events did you guys do as Visit Loudoun to celebrate this occasion? Uh, yeah, October is, uh, is huge for Virginia Wine Month. It's the most beautiful time to come visit with all the colors changing and the um, harvest going on and everything. So our biggest event during October was Epicureans Virginia, which is a food and wine festival featuring not just Loudoun, but Virginia products. Um, we also supported the Loudoun Wine Awards, which recognizes the best in Loudoun wines. Um, they submit their wines for the event and wine professionals judge it. Um, it's similar to like a governor's cup, but it's all about raising the level of Loudoun wine and just promoting how great it is. Now, we'd be remiss to, if we didn't mention the great craft beer, craft distilling, craft cider um, industry that Loudoun has as well. Can you talk a little bit to that and how all of these beverages come together and really emphasize Loudoun County? Yeah, the beverage industry in Loudoun County right now is extremely successful. Um, wineries and vineyards have been dominating Loudoun for the past 10 years, but in the past three years, it's had a huge increase in uh, breweries, distilleries, and cideries. Um, I think the number of breweries has doubled in the past three years, which is just ridiculously amazing. Um, so it's a great product and it's, you know, really unique and we love having it in Loudoun. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on. We're going to catch back up with you at the end of the show. Um, but I wanted to say, uh, as we move into the next section, which we're going to start with Adroit Theory Brewing Company. Thank you, everybody who is here on Facebook. Thank you, everybody that's come over from Twitter or whatnot. If you think people are inter uh, interested in the show and as we go through and share these other producers, um, <laughs> uh, 
please share this out. Uh, throw up some comments and throw up some love. We'll answer some questions on air. And we love to get the engagement. We love to get you involved in this live show because that's what this really is all about, live and engaging and with you. So Stub, I think we're ready to move into the brewing part. I, I believe so. As Kelsey said, the uh, craft beer uh, game in Loudoun County has exploded over the last couple of years. Uh, we're going to be joined in just a, a half a minute here by Mark Osborne of Adroit Theory Brewing. Uh, but first, we're going to take a little bit of a, a quick look at his brewery uh, from our visit there uh, before we get into our discussion. We do love big, boozy beers here at Adroit. This is no exception. All right, so we're now bringing on and welcoming to the show Mark, Mark Osborne, owner of Adroit Theory Brewing Company. Um, we are going to start, Mark, with a probably a question you get asked quite a bit. Uh, number one, do you love your job? But number two, how did you uh, actually get into craft brewing uh, as a vocation? Sure, sure. I mean, it came from a uh, from a from a fan perspective, really. I mean, I love uh, craft beer. I love uh, visiting breweries and going to festivals. I was that type of person, and uh, I saw the uh, the age forty on the horizon, and I decided that it was time to do something new in my life and my career. And here I would focus on something that I was uh, passionate about, you know, from a consumer perspective. And passion, as you mentioned, is so important in the industry. Um, I think as we're going forward and we're talking about passion, I think we should start with the name. Did, did passion come through because to the name? Because it's really unique. And I would love if you would sh share with us the insight behind that. And as well as your manifesto that you ha have hanging quite largely at the brewery. Sure. So for those that don't know, adroit um, basically means that you're skilled with your hands. So if you think about a craftsman uh, being skilled at his, uh, as a, at his profession, that, that's the definition of droid. But it also means clever. Mm -hmm. So if you think about you know, making beer, which is a relatively you know, basic process uh, with simple ingredients, uh, you know, turning it into something as, as magical as beer, I think, is a really um, great description of a droid. And the theory, of course, is we make concept beers primarily versus you know, standard to style brews so you put the two together and uh, kind of summarizes what we do but uh in regards to our manifesto yes we we have a manifesto and when you come to visit us in person or even if you see some of our packaging it you know the message i think is pretty clear it's that we we, we don't follow the status quo we try to push uh the envelope both in terms of uh, beer styles as well as taste profiles but also you know from a company you know in terms of you know, our passion uh, for the brewing industry and, and for being in Loudoun in particular, but also that, you know, we're not doing what everybody else is doing, whether that's, you know, here in Virginia or, you know, on the Mid-Atlantic, you know, we really feel like uh, we have something different to, to tell and, uh, and we've built the entire company, you know, based on that philosophy. Wow. Uh, that's awesome, Mark. Thanks for uh, sharing that. Uh, when Jen and I visited uh, the brewery a couple weeks ago, you hosted us so kindly, uh, we got to uh, look in on a little bit of a boil uh, for the uh, for a batch of Tenebris and took a little bit of a shot of that. So we're going to show that if we can very briefly, and then maybe have you talk about uh, some of the brewing process post what we were able to witness then. Sure. We're in the middle Tenebris of brewing a, uh, a beer called Tenebris, which is an American uh, barley wine. Once before, we are in the boiling phase whereby you're adding, when the timer goes off, various things. In this case, this is hops. This is the second hop edition. We'll have uh, a third and a fourth hop edition at 20 minutes to, to the end and at the very end. Uh, and also we'll be adding sugar. This is the 10 minute edition. Sugar increases the alcohol content of the beer. Basically what Brewers do is provide, try to make yeast happy. 
uh, you boil down everything that we do to same thing with winemakers. It's the exact same the process. Cool. So we started, saw the start of that boil there, Mark. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the brewing process and maybe expand on, you said you, you don't make typical beers uh, that people think of when you decide to make something, you just kind of make what you want. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that maybe? Sure. So we, um, we don't have a, a flagship uh, beer or a, a line of beers that we make on an ongoing perpetual basis, uh, which is definitely out of the ordinary. Most breweries, you know, have a, have a core portfolio. Um, we've been in business almost three years, and we've made over 500 distinct beers in that period. Um, so it's always about experimentation and making, you know, new and interesting flavor profiles. Uh, the beer that you saw in the video is Tenebris. It's a beer we've made once, uh, once before, and we're readdressing it. Uh, you saw us brewing a, a pilot batch uh, before we brew a bigger batch, uh, which we'll be doing over the winter. But um, you know, that beer, as well as a lot of the beers that we make, do tend to be uh, big and brash, um, boozy, uh, beers that are usually uh, higher ABV and usually very complex uh, palate profile. So uh, Tenebris is no exception. And uh, once that beer finishes fermenting, we'll put the regular version on draft straight away. So look for that here uh, in mid-November. Mm -hmm. And then when we do the production batch, uh, you can uh, rest assured we'll put uh, a high percentage of that beer into used spirit barrels or used wine barrels. And we'll break out different variants, uh, you know, several months later in the year. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, uh, you know, one of the things when we visited, I really loved hearing about the uniqueness of your brewing line. I also found it was super interesting that you didn't stick to the seasonal, uh, you know, flow of how beers go. You know, what is that process that you guys decide what exactly is right for the, the timing and your, your audience and your customers? Uh, well, honestly, we <laughs> we don't think that much about what the customer might want to uh, you know to drink at a given day or given time, which perhaps we should. But um, you know, we have 25 beers on draft, for instance, today at our tasting room. Uh, we have zero pale ales. Um, we have one IPA, but it's a black IPA. Um, so again, you know, we're not thinking about oh, you know, what what does the average person want to drink? We try to make interesting beers with uh, ingredients that are in season and a lot of our decisions are made by what barrels we can get uh, when we can get them and we try to make a brewing schedule around that as the focal point uh, versus you know pumpkins in the fall and you know light delicate beers in the spring we, we serve big boozy beers year round. yeah of course and we would be remiss at this point if we didn't mention you released uh three new beers this week is that correct? Yep. So uh, a pretty typical week for us. Again, this is all small batch. Uh, we're a very small brewery, so it gives us the flexibility to you know, have a high volume of different beers. But uh, on average, we release three brand new beers every week. Again, we have 25 beers on draft at our tasting room. Um, so it allows us to have a pretty diverse um, you know, portfolio of beers at any given time. But if you come you know, tomorrow and then you come back a month from now, you know, half or more of the menu will have turned over in that time period. Yeah, uh, and let's go back to what I kind of mentioned with passion. It's very obvious that you're passionate about it. Whether or not you're tuned into exactly what the customer wants, you put a lot of heart into what you're, what you're doing. So sometimes you're giving them what they may not know they really like. So I love that about it. Um, Passion is also found in all types of beverages in, in Loudoun County. Can you talk a little bit to why you picked Loudoun County and what what the county brings to you as a cr part of the craft brew industry? Sure. Um, you know, for those that aren't familiar with Loudoun County, it is absolutely a gorgeous and beautiful place to live and to visit. I, I live here. Um, we opened the brewery because it's five minutes from my house, uh, <laughs> which I guess is supposedly selfish. But, um, you know, the local government, particularly the town of Percival, which we're, where we're located, is very business friendly. So, you know, we didn't run into a lot of the challenges that other breweries do or you know, have to deal with, you know, dealing with their local and state governments. So, you know, we love it. I also love the fact that we already had a well-established uh, wine 
industry. So we already have wine tourists that come and visit, and it's just a natural extension uh, for the husbands in the group to go and visit a brewery or two uh, while they're out touring the wineries. And of course, uh, cideries and distilleries uh, are beginning to flourish as well. So just a, a no brainer. Yeah, I, I love visiting. I love coming out and seeing what new types of all, all types of the beverage industry is popping up in Loudoun every year. Uh, so, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we loved having you. We can't wait to come back out and visit. And if anybody out in the audience would like to visit a Droit Theory Brewing Company, take a look at, uh, at their website. It's www.adroit-theory.com and go visit. I I'm sure Mark would be more than welcome to pour you a pint. In, indeed, I'm sure he would. He poured us a couple while we were there. We didn't consume all of them, but uh, he poured us. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Mark. Uh, we've discussed some beer today. Now we're going to go ahead and move on to some wine. Uh, and we're going to take a look at uh, quick look at our visit out to uh, Fabioli Cellars uh, before we introduce Doug Fabioli, the owner. Here we go. <music> I'm Doug Fabioli, uh, owner and winemaker at Fabioli Cellars in Leesburg. Uh, Doug, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, once again, I'm getting the easy questions today because I know you answer this all of the time. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you found yourself uh, in the wine business, if you don't mind, sir. Sure. Well, I started in uh, upstate New York. Uh, I was working a small vineyard while I was going to Syracuse University, and I like the the outdoors I uh, enjoyed the production in the vineyard and I said you know I think I can make a living at this so um, my girlfriend who's my wife now said okay and uh, here we are 28 years later she's still saying okay so we went to uh, California we spent 10 years out there I worked at Buena Vista Winery in Sonoma I learned a lot of process I did a lot of production uh, took classes out there as well and then uh, Moved to Loudoun County in 1997, and really, uh, you know, we, at the time we had four wineries uh, under production, and now we're up to 40. And I was lucky enough to help a lot of those folks get started and, and move along in the process of uh, of getting their own businesses going. So it's it's been a fun ride. And that's a great segue into our next question. Um, and, you know, as we're talking about Loudoun County, as we're talking about Loudoun County uh, holistically, what attracted you as a winemaker to come to Loudoun County? Was it that you could, you know, start with the, the grassroots and help people grow and you could all grow together? Or was it just sheer love of the, the landscape? Well, you know, sometimes things happen and you don't really know why. And then they kind of evolve and they start to show themselves. So. Uh, I came to Loudoun because it was close to my in-laws up in uh, up in Rocco, Maryland. And uh, uh, Loudoun was just burgeoning. I realized being on the ground level of a startup industry here uh, was going to be a good position for me. Um, and then as I kept going, I found a, a bigger role for me of uh, helping other wineries get started, of of really uh, uh, being a big player in this to, to uh, help, help as we say, all boats lift in a rising tide. So, so our collaboration has been really strong in leading that um, so, that, so that we could get established in a way where um, we, we were able to learn things along the way better than others and, and get some good establishment over the last 20 years. Cool, Doug. Uh, so kind of sticking with, you know, your uniqueness and doing some different things, which you sort of mentioned, what I find to be maybe your most unique wine is your uh, pear port. And I think it's a reserve where you grow a pear in the bottle uh, of the wine. Um, can you tell us a little story about how you got to to uh, decide to make that specific wine? Well, the, the that's one, again, where, you know, sometimes things come at you and you got to learn how to dance with it. And uh, we had a couple of Asian pear trees on the bottle, or on the, on the farm here. 
And we started making a wine out of that. I saw some other people making these port style whites. And I went ahead and established this wine. And then my brother-in-law gave me a bottle of pear brandy that had the pear inside of it. And kind of the way we do is I'm like, I can do that. I can do that. So we did. So we started growing the pears on the tree. or the, the, We hang the bottle on the tree in spring. We train that pear inside of it. And then it'll hang out there all season long. And then at the end, we harvest it off and we put our pear port inside. So kind of a unique, almost a novelty product. But uh, it's a it's a fun little thing that, um, that that's given us some good recognition over the years. Cool. Perfect. Um, and I want to take an opportunity to really thank everybody in Facebook Live that's joined us. Uh, I love seeing the comments. Debbie and Chris, thank you so much for joining us. These are great uh, wine and live streamers that I know and love out there. I'm glad you're liking the show and and really appreciate Rob from Enlightened uh, Audiovisual to what they're bringing and bringing out the beverage industry in Loudoun, uh, Virginia. So I wanted to stick on the the pear discussion. It's really interesting, really unique, and I think it, it brings something of great value to Fabioli when you have so many great beverages out in Loudoun County. That's really, it brings something unique. But there's also something else that's unique that you're making, it, uh, the Solera process. And could you tell us or why, how or why you're using that process and what uniqueness that brings to your, to your wine? Sure. Well, so the, the rough idea of a Solera is it's an aging um, blending process that has been used in sherries and ports for generations back in Europe. And at the bottom level of your Solera, uh, is the barrels, and, and you take your, your finished wine out of the bottom, which only come up half. And then you take the wine from above, and you bring that down into the, uh, the, the half-empty barrels. So that way, you're kind of blending what was newer with what's older. And that process keeps working its way up the, up the tower, basically, as you see um, you know, in, a, in a stack of barrels of four. Um, so they work their way down to a point where the fresh wine is up top, the older wine is down below, but there's a little bit of that old wine. In our, in our case, it goes back to 2009 when we started the Solaris system. Each year it's going to be a little less, but it's, the wine is, it's, it adds a consistency to it. It gives it that aging process. Um, it, you know, there's always some barrel influence in the, uh, in the breathing of the wood. And it's just kind of an old school thing that, you know, we love to do innovative stuff. We love to embrace uh, the historic stuff as well and finding how we can bring those two together. And I think that pair of wine is something that, you know, nobody talks about doing something like that in America, but there are some beautiful pear wines and Paris and different things that have been done in Europe and different niche areas over, again, for generations. It's kind of cool. Cool. Well, another thing, Doug, uh, pulling into your, uh, onto your property there is uh, the building that houses your tasting room and I guess underneath that, the barrel room we just saw in the uh, video next to you there. Uh, it's quite striking. It's basically a round building. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the design for that? Was that a winemaking thing or was that just a specific, we think this design is cool and want to go with that? Well, my wife initially envisioned a yurt and I, I love that, that roundness of a yurt, but I told her, I said, honey, it's not big enough. We can't heat it. We can't cool it. It's we could do it, but it's going to be challenging. And then she got uh, she talked to some people and she found this building and it's called a it's called a Dell Tech. It's, a, it's actually a home design that they built down in Asheville, North Carolina. So it's a kit that came out here in three tractor trailers. And, you know, we're, we're a bootstrap operation. I don't have a lot of money to pay other people to do things. So we kind of use our team and and as much knowledge and, 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 you know, brute strength as we can. Um, I like the idea of adroit because we do a lot of things with our hands and uh, we built this thing ourselves. So I brought in a field consultant for two weeks to assemble this and then everything else inside was us. So all of the, the plumbing, electrical, drywall, all of the finishings were us in order to get this working. And it's, it's been a great project and it fits with the land and it fits us. And it's just a nice, now that we've moved from our, our cellar of the house to where we have some space to, uh, to share, the customers get a really you know, top-notch experience uh, coming out to our, uh, to our small establishment. 
you know, that's an amazing transition from concept of a yurt all the way to winemaker of the year at the second annual Loudon Wine Awards. What does this honor mean to you? You know, what is the process? What does that, what does that mean? Well, you know, we joke around sometimes that, you know, that some have dubbed me the godfather of Loudoun County wine. And I say, yeah, godfather without the violence. You know, we try to, <laughs> we try to help each other out and really set a tone. And, and it's based on, on quality. You know, I, if somebody calls me up, I'm going to talk to them. Whether they're, you know, if they're a small wine, home winemaker, if they're, you know, some make people think about uh, competition. We don't have that. We collaborate. We want to make good quality. We want people to come out and know that they're going to get good, good experience. They're going to get good products. Um, and that stems right into the brewers and uh, defiance with the ciders and the, and the distillery. You know, we, we all are on this page together. We want to do it in a way where it's sustainable for generations. We're respecting the land that we're on. And um, I guess the honor of Winemaker of the Year is just an extension of, of that whole theme that I've learned from others and really try to be the ambassador of, the promoter of, that, you know, we're here, we're here to stay and we're here um, uh, with great quality and things to offer people that want to enjoy what we do. Yeah, and I think I think that's a pretty solid way and a solid message to convey about the craft. Even even the wine in Loudoun County, I would say, is pretty craft in nature. So craft uh, beer, wine, cider, and spirits, so that it's a cooperative environment. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today, Doug. I appreciate your time. And for the audience out there in Facebook, thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for sharing and finding out more information about Fabioli in the comments. But for anybody else that would like more information, please go visit them in the Leesburg Tasting Room or at FabioliWines.com. Indeed. Yes. Thank, thanks for joining us, Doug, so much. And thanks for hosting us uh, at the winery a, week, a couple weeks ago. My pleasure, Steph. All right. So we've discussed now Loudon beer and Loudon wines. We are now going to move on to Loudon cider and spirits. And I think the name gives it away, but Mount Defiance Cidery and Distillery produces both cider and spirits. And we're once again going to take a quick look at uh, Jen and I's visit to Mount Defiance a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I wish everybody could see the behind the scenes here. It's it's a dance party with that music to the video. So I'm going to start off because I had the, the great fortune of spending some time with Mark uh, Creighton from Mount Defiance, and he is the cider master over at Mount Defiance. Um, so Mark, good morning. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fine, Jen. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, you're totally welcome. You know, I had a great opportunity to go out and barrel taste, which we saw some clips of that, uh, your General Reserves, uh, General's Reserve Cider. Um, so let's take a little bit of a look of that, and then maybe you can talk to me about it a little. Or we could just start talking about it now, and then we'll entry the videos. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Can you tell us what we tasted in the barrel, or you? Okay, you, what you tasted in the barrel is a normal, our mainstay cider, which is called farmhouse style. It is a classic uh, artisanal cider that has been aged in used bourbon barrels, a distillery by law is required to age their bourbon for two years in an oak barrel and they can only use those barrels once and then we only use the barrels once not because there's a law about it but uh, the cider will then take on the taste and the flavors of the bourbon and then after that once it's aged well it's time to use the, the barrels as planters then because it sucked the uh, flavor out of it and what you tasted was bourbon aged cider well, I think we have the video now. Let's get a little peek so the audience can see what the tasting was like, and then we'll go back to talking about it a little bit more. 
This is a bourbon barrel aged cider that we call the General's Reserve. It was named after a general I worked for in Iraq named General Allen. Last May we poured this in to an old bourbon barrel, fresh bourbon barrel, and it's been in there for eh, four months now, five months, and it has a nose. If you'll take a little whip of it, you should be able to detect a bourbon nose. Okay, so it has a little bit of uh, barrel in it. It hasn't been filtered, so it's still cloudy. Mm -hmm. And it has about definitely a strong bourbon taste and also malolactic acid, which is a natural um, process that occurs with cider resting in a barrel. So if it is Carbon, if it's carbonated and then chilled to about 38 degrees, it actually tastes kind of nice. We can only use the barrel once, oh, really? not be, by law, but because it leaches, it gets all the taste of the bourbon out of it, and so you can't, doesn't do any good afterwards. So we have some bourbon aging in our back as well, but it will be another eh, six months or more before our distiller thinks it's ready and needs a few counts. Well, thank you very much for this. You're yeah, very welcome. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I love watching that back because it was such a fun little opportunity. There's not a ton of people that get to do barrel samples. So I love that you invited us in and got, gave us a chance to taste cider directly from the barrel. Now that uh, the General's Reserve isn't quite ready yet. When will it be ready? Oh, next month. Next month. Right. Um, and that kind of goes in line with all of the ever-changing ciders you have on tap at any given time. Do What what makes you decide what ciders come in and out um, at, at any given time? Well, we're always on the lookout for neat things to use to co-ferment and ferment with, uh, like a fruit to ferment with the uh, with apple cider. Uh, last month, we found uh, our friends at Cana Winery had some Petit Verdot grapes. Uh, we bought a, a fair amount of those, but we co-fermented that, and we're now making a cider rosé, which is an apple cider wine blend, uh, heavier on the cider than the uh, than the wine. And initial taste tests are great. Uh, so essentially, we try to we try to go down the road of where can we find fresh ingredients that are local that we can make and differentiate our cider as an artisanal cider. You, you kind of stole my thunder there. That was going to be my next question is like, how, how does, how do you get along with your local industry? Because that's one great thing about Loudoun County is there's so many great agricultural products, great uh, wineries out there. Are you excited to do more things like that in the future? And do you see collaboration as the way to go forward? Yes, uh, we're not that competitive because all of us have our own niche basically. And the uh, Fabioli uh, winery that you had on earlier, he stopped in, gave us great advice. We chatted with them. I hope I was of some use to him as well. Uh, but it, it, that's the, the wonderful thing about Loudon right now is that it's small enough that most of us are friends. We're not, and there's plenty of business to go around. There's a good demand for artisanal uh, wine and cider and spirit. So it's not, there's no cutthroat competitive stuff out here we, we tend to um we tend to love collaborations like i'm very happy that we're going to make a vermouth with cana winery and i'll be happy to do something with fabioli down the road if there's something that's mutually uh interesting to both of us we're always up for stuff like that so from here we're going to uh segue into uh peter elf who is your distiller at mount Su at mount defiance but i wanted to ask you a quick question what how did you guys come up with this combination of a cidery and a distillery together well he had the, peter has the distilling skills and i was more uh, i had some experience in cider the age-old problem with the distillery is if you're going to make whiskey or bourbon, it's several years before when you start and when you can actually sell a product. Cider only takes a few months, even the best cider, maximum of four to five months. And so with the combination of having a cidery and a distillery, we'd have some cash flow uh, that would allow us to take a longer period of time. 
uh, so far that's worked out for us. Perfect. So before, one really quick transition as well that I was going to make is to, is to address some of the comments that we got in Facebook. Um, I noticed from Debbie who says, what do you do with the barrels afterwards? Which I think you kind of hinted at and have some good suggestions for, Mark. Well, we, we do sell them. Our, uh, essentially, a lot of home brewers will buy them. Uh, they will like the cider taste to it or they'll buy from Peter and his old rum barrels because they like the taste of rum. Uh, and we also have brandy barrels. So if they if that's a flavor that they want to enhance uh, their products with, they're welcome to buy them. It, the barrels are so hard to find. There was a shortage, a national shortage, that uh, you basically sell them for close to what you paid for them. And if you're doing anything that adds taste to it, more power to you. Perfect. I think this is a great time, since we've talked about all types of barrels now, to turn it over to Stubb and Peter Alf, the distiller. Indeed. Mark, thank you for joining us as Peter gets in his chair. Uh, you saw Jen get to do a barrel tasting of cider when we visited. Uh, I was a little more adventurous and got to do a tasting of their absinthe. And we're going to take a quick look at that to try to explain the proper absinthe tasting process. All right. All right, so we're here at Mount Defiance, and we are going to be tasting your... Uh, this is our absinthe. absinthe. Yes, Great. Mount Defiance absinthe. Uh, we serve it the traditional French style um, with our absinthe fountain here. This is how you would uh, be served if you came to our spot in Middleburg here. So this is a half ounce that I pour into the glass right here with the absinthe spoon. And we'll dilute it with the chilled water and a sugar cube. Um, so chilled water, not everybody has a fountain at home, of course. Sure. Um, but chilled water is most necessary. Um, it brings out all the oils of the absinthe one at a time um, and releases all those oils. Really nice. So you've got so. the sugar cube, which equals about a teaspoon or so of sugar yeah. on, on um, average. Yeah, about that, that sounds about right. We actually make our own dis uh, sugar cubes here. Wow, uh, yeah. yeah, and you want to dilute it quite a bit. Okay. Some people think maybe dripping a couple drops of water and whatnot, but right. yeah, quite a bit. We can go to like a one to three, one to four ratio. Okay. That's what we're gonna shoot for. And there. the drip's obviously important to get the sugar to dissolve, dissolve. into so the glass. The, yeah, the sugar may dissolve um, first. Um, it kind of helps with that in, initial anise and fennel taste that you get. Okay. Um, that's what I find with it. And uh, so yeah, it's, it's um, after dinner. It's a good digestive. So that's a one to three ratio with the oh, water. Wow. So it's got, yeah, that, that the drink, so, as you're drinking it, the, the flavor really changes, your taste buds get used to certain uh, certain flavors, and then you get the lemon balm, mm -hmm. which is one of the ingredients as well. This is amazing. Great. I can't wait to uh, sit with this at home by myself at some yes. point later. <laughs> All right, joining us, uh, as we said, is Peter Alf, distiller at Mount Defiance uh, Cidery and Distillery. Uh, Peter, let me start by asking, I'm pretty certain that uh, Mount Defiance is the only distillery in Virginia making absinthe, is that true? Yes, that's absolutely true. In fact, there's probably 30 or 40 distilleries in the United States that are making absinthe, and we're the only one right now in Virginia. And can I ask you, uh, what led you to that decision to, um, to uh, make absinthe in your in your distillery? Well, we, I kind of think of Mount Defiance as the land of forgotten spirits. A lot of the things that we make, the common thread that goes through them, is that there are things that were popular way back when, and for one reason or another, they sort of fell out of favor. And absinthe is a, a perfect example of this. Back in the late 1800s, it was hugely popular, in, both in France, and Britain, Europe, in, and in America. But then for mostly specious, specious reasons, it was banned from production in many, many countries. So after 80 years of not being made in the United States, just about 10 years ago, uh, production began again. And we figured that this was a niche that we could fill with the, with the mystery and the lore that, is, that goes along with absinthe. We thought it would be something that would be really fun to try to bring back and reintroduce to the American public. Yeah, that's awesome. And as at the end of that video, uh, I really, really enjoyed your absinthe and it was been doing my best to perfect a Sazerac for the last couple of years, so I'm looking forward to using your absinthe for that uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so you make your absinthe, but you also make some other unique uh, uh, liquors and uh, distilled spirits there. How do you go about choosing? Because you do make some things that uh, 
perhaps others would think would be an unusual combination for a distillery. Right. Well, obviously, since we're, we're a cidery as well, right, you know, 10 feet away from me, we have a bunch of hard ciders, so it's natural for me to take that hard cider and distill it into apple brand. That's another product that in revolutionary times, when people came over from England, they drank hard cider, and when they started distilling spirits, that was one of the first things that they did. Uh, so again, apple popularity into popularity. Rum is another case, you know, back in, back in the revolutionary days, rum is the, the most popular spirit in the United States. And also rum, like Mark said, it doesn't have to stay in the barrel for two years. It's something that we can make, release a white rum that could go on the market right away, while our other rums age in, in small barrels for a little while. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is our cassis liqueur. Uh, cassis liqueur is made from black currants. And black currants were, again, banned from cultivation in the United States back in, in uh, 19, I'm sorry, uh, 1906, I believe. And that, that's because of the concerns that there were regarding a fungus that white pines would, could catch that shared uh, the same insect vector that, uh, that the black currant bushes had. So it's only been, I think, 13 years since Greg Quinn in New York State uh, kind of got the legislation enacted to allow cultivation of black currants. And we actually go to him and his farm in Hudson Valley around harvest time every year, and we pick up hundreds of pounds of black currants. Wow right back down to the distillery and start making our cassis. In fact, we just started bottling it about two weeks ago for the uh, 2016 harvest. Wow, that's really cool. I love that you go directly to the farm to uh, get your currants for that spirit. Uh, but you also, as we were just seeing here in the video next to you, you have your own uh, garden uh, for growing some of the botanicals for some of your spirits. Uh, what made you decide to, to, to grow your own uh, herbs and botanicals? I think the real key to have making a fantastic absinthe, and we really wanted to have one of the best absinths in the United States, is, is the ingredients. So we grow, it, absinthe is made from both leafy herbs and some seeds. Now the seeds are aniseed and fennel seed. We actually import those from France, in the case of fennel, from Provence, it's a special type of fennel called fennel dew, and we get our green aniseed from Andalusia, Spain. It's hard to replicate that in the United States, but the leafy herbs, Virginia is not a bad place to grow them, so it's, we get, get what, by growing them ourselves, we get them as fresh as bee, and, and they really go into making fantastic absinthe. Wow, yes, it, I will once again vouch for the absinthe is fantastic, uh, and in that tasting video you saw me, I was not drinking as quickly as it looked towards the end. Um, so you seem all about, Peter, maybe as a final question here, um, you seem all about kind of combining the old and the new, that's a little obvious in your tasting room. Uh, with, um, for lack of a better word, maybe kind of a steampunk vibe in there uh, with some of the fixtures and things. Can you talk a little bit, a bit about that, uh, maybe aesthetically, and how that works in your uh, in your distilling? Sure. Well, uh, it's interesting. Mark and I, who you, you, we just spoke with, have been, have been friends for a long time, and we got to know, know each other because I was actually a, a cabinet maker before I began distilling. So when Mark bought this, uh, this old garage for the distillery and the cidery, he hired me to do the tasting room and he loves steampunk. He introduced me to the whole idea. So we sort of together developed the idea for the, for the tasting room and, and it kind of went with the whole, like you said, the vibe we're trying to create with for the, uh, for the overall business. Well, that is awesome, really awesome. And I wanna thank uh, Peter, you and Mark both for joining us today. Uh, please get a chance, anyone viewing, go visit Mount Defiance Cidery and Distillery in, Distillery in Middleburg. It is an amazing place, uh, friendly hospitality, uh, great. And if you want to find out more information about them, visit mountmtdefiance.com. So I think now we're going to bring Kelsey back on to help us wrap up and tell us a little bit more about Loudoun County and how its beverage industry um, affects other aspects of tourism. Yeah, and Kelsey, you're so fortunate to, to be part of Visit Loudon as the marketing coordinator and to have so many great craft uh, beverage uh, companies and facilities right there locally. So how does all this great beverage companies, these beverage facilities help Loudon County increase their tourism? Uh, well, I think someone said it best in the comments that they're huge foodies and learning about this industry in the background um, to be able to mix and match and pair stuff is really important. So food is obviously a great additional product to wine, beer, spirits, and ciders. And we do have a great 
booming dining industry in Loudoun. Um, we have a lot of great farm to tables, a lot of awesome chefs, um, new restaurants coming on all the time that can utilize these products. Um, over the weekend at Epicureans, we had Ford's Fish Shack make an oyster soup with an Old Ox brew, which was awesome. So that collaborative experience that you can have in Loudoun with all this great like local products is just huge. Yeah, I, the the local product, the local food and beverage industry working together is great. Um, but being that Kelsey, you're from Visit Loudon, where we uh, would be a little remiss if we didn't mention the um, recreational opportunities that Loudon has to offer outside of the actual uh, eating and drinking. Uh, can you discuss that a little bit for us? Yeah, sure. So Loudon is also known as Hunt Country. Um, Middleburg, Virginia, is in Loudon, and it's one of the oldest horse countries um, in the state. So we have a lot of, of horse equestrian histor history, um, as well as like outdoor attractions. Um, there's Harper's Ferry Adventure Center and Empower. You can zip line, go white water rafting, um, as well as a lot of historic sites. Oatlands is beautiful. Morven is beautiful. Um, there's a lot of you know, historic sites that you can visit and tour around, which is um, a lot of fun. There's also a huge biking. Um, industry out here as well with the W and O and D trail running through Loudoun. It's absolutely beautiful to go biking. Plus there are a lot of brewery stops on the way if you wanted to reward yourself after a nice bike ride. That is indeed true. I um, I love going out to Loudoun County. It is gorgeous. It is particularly gorgeous this time of year uh, with the changing leaves and they're actually changing maybe a little bit later this year than normal if I recall. Mm -hmm. uh, but Kelsey, I want to thank you for coming on and talking to us a little about Loudoun County and helping us get in touch with uh, Mark and, and Doug and Mark and Peter and, and helping us put all this together. And if you want to learn more about Loudoun County, uh, especially the beverages, but everything else as well, uh, go to visit And I'm okay. sure Kelsey will be happy to uh, help you figure out what you need to do if you visit Loudoun County. Thank you guys for having us. Very welcome. Yes, and uh, I would like to also thank all of our guests. I'd like to, you know, Mark and Mark, and if there's another Mark in there, you're awesome too, Peter and Doug. And uh, thank you for your hospitality. Coming out there was is such a great experience for Stubb and I. I also want to thank the production team with enlightened uh, audio visual. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Jen. You guys are amazing. Uh, don't forget, if you love this content, you like what we're doing here, please follow me on Wine Antics. And that's on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. And of course, follow Stub as Cork Envy on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. And of course, we have both have the dot coms, wineantics.com and corkenvy.com. Uh, we hope to see you next Thursday, or this upcoming Thursday, I should say, for Thirsty Thursday with Wine Antics Live. So that the, the Wine Antics Facebook page has great weekly wine shows. This week we're featuring Amanda Barnes from uh, Around the World in 80 Harvest. Looking forward to seeing her things. And if you like what this is as a, as a wine region, as a, as a distilleries guild, please reach out to either Stubb or I, and we'd love to feature your uh, industry, your association, your region, and go forward with that. Otherwise, thank you everybody, and I look forward to the next Beyond the Bottle. <laughs>